What do you see? I see you standing against the wall and me standing next to you telling you to get a move exactly. on. Exactly! So Look! We're in the same frame! So? Hatter, we've done 26 of these reviews. We're never in the same frame. Would you stop staring at me? Sorry, I'm just not used to actually seeing you. That's well, all. get past it. It's not any different from the clones or the other alternate personas, is it? It's a little different. Not really. Come on, Matt, admit this is a little strange for you. For 26 reviews, we have been the same person, and now we're two separate people. Don't you think that's a little odd? Of course it is. And especially is. for someone like you who's stuck in his ways and doesn't like change. What's that supposed to mean? Well, I assume that's why you're always defending the original version of the story, okay. you know. You know what? I can't take this. You are way more annoying in real life. I'm out of here. You, you can't go now, we've got a tie to break. I'm still gonna do the review, Hatter, just not here. Why don't you get things started and I'll join you. Okay. Hello, friends and neighbors. As you know, if you watched the previous Books vs. Movies review, Matt and I are, once again, tied. And a while back, I asked you to vote on what should be the next Books vs. Movies review tiebreaker, and you overwhelmingly picked this one. The story of a little boy who never grows up. Peter Pan is another story that has an interesting history. Not a lot of people know that it was originally a stage play, written by J.M. Barry and then turned into a children's novel. And in light of that fact, I suppose that we could make this another three-way review, but we're not going to. What? Why not? Uh, well, for one thing, the original stage version is too much like the book. For another, we're already comparing it to three different movie adaptations. And for another, we just don't want to. <sighs> oh, fine. But you haven't seen the last of me, gentlemen. I'm sure we haven't. At any rate, we've decided to go the Christmas Carol route on this one and compare it to three different movie adaptations. For this review, we've chosen the classic Disney animated version from 1953 and the more recent 2003 live action version. The first because it's considered a classic, and the second because it's probably the most faithful adaptation of the story out there. And finally, a somewhat unconventional choice, we've decided to also look at the 1991 Disney movie Hook, starring Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman. Even though it's more of a sequel to Peter Pan rather than an adaptation of the story, it still has most of the original characters and enough references to the original story that it does feel like an adaptation of Peter Pan. Peter Pan is another one of those stories that, like A Christmas Carol, has had a profound impact on our culture and is told over and over again. But which version of the story will come out on top? Let's find out. This is Books vs. Movies review of Peter Pan. Okay, Matt, the intro is played. Are you ready to go yet? All right, I'm here. Wait, where are you? My own personal Neverland, Hatter. A place where I can escape and be with my imagination. You're at the Bookloft in German Village, aren't you? The ultimate bookshelf background, Hatter. A bookshelf that never ends. I'm pretty sure it does. But well, whatever, actually. I'm doing the review here anyway. Well, if you're gonna have your own Neverland for this review, then so am I. <sighs> there. Your Neverland is four feet away from your reviewing space. It's a never-ending movie night, Matt. I can actually see the television and everything. Okay, well now that we've both found our own personal Neverlands, let's get things started by looking at the darling children, Wendy, Michael, and John. Though, in reality, it's pretty much just Wendy. John and Michael really don't get that much time in this story. Their purpose is basically to illustrate the age differences between the three characters. Michael is the young child, John is the slightly older child, and Wendy is on the boundary between childhood and adolescence. This age difference is illustrated largely in how extensively they forget about their home and how much they start to see Neverland as their reality. But the Disney movie especially actually gives John and Michael some personality and growth. We see John becoming something of a leader to the Lost Boys, and we see Michael actually using his brain and fighting off the pirates. I mean, tell me that you've never Never wanted to fight off a pirate with your teddy bear. I've never wanted to fight off pirates with- Not you, you had no childhood. The other versions of the story, including the book, pretty much just have John and Michael becoming a part of the chorus of Lost Boys. But in the book, we do see John and Michael demonstrating loyalty when they're offered a position on Captain Hook's ship. They're tempted by Hook's offer, but they ultimately rebuff him because they are loyal to King George and England. In the Disney movie, John and Michael don't hesitate to join Hook's crew when their lives are threatened. And in the 2003 movie, the offer is actually made to Wendy to make her a pirate. They even use one of the same names that was offered to one of the boys in the book. I 
thought of calling myself mm -hmm. Red Handed Jill. Oh, what a marvelous name! And John and Michael just kind of fade into the background. And as for Wendy, it's easy to kind of write her off as a silly lovesick character, especially given some of the theatrical portrayals, but she's actually a very strong character. Yeah, she wants to be a wife and mother first and foremost, but there's nothing wrong with that, and she is very firm in that desire. And she demonstrates great loyalty to the children, even though she knows they're not really hers. But pretty much universally, the Wendy's from the movies are stronger. Wendy from the Disney movie is actually one of the better Disney heroines. When John, Michael, and the other Lost Boys run off to join Hook's crew, Wendy's the one that calls them back. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? And even after Peter Pan seems dead and their salvation is hopeless, she still would rather die than join a band of pirates. Captain Hook, we will never join your crew. Wendy in the 2003 version still makes the same decision in the end, though she is actually tempted by the offer, as a child of her age might be. What would Mother think of Am I becoming a pirate? Also, this Wendy actually fights, whereas the Wendy from the book just kind of stands in the background during the fight. And as for Wendy and Hook, well, she's played by Maggie Smith, first of all. And second of all, it is interesting to see what she did with her life. In addition to raising her own family, she also made it possible for other lost boys to find families. She took her Neverland experience and did something useful and constructive with it, and she's lived a full, rich life. In the book, though she's still loyal to her own philosophies, she pretty much just fades into the background during the final fight, whereas in the movie, she's almost always there. So I much prefer the Wendy's from the movies. But what about that scurvy dog, that traitorous villain, that slimy bit of seaweed not fit to- <coughs> Sorry, got carried away. Captain Hook. Captain Hook represents pretty much everything that Peter Pan is against. He's a liar, a cheat, a scoundrel, and worst of all, an adult. The story really plays up Captain Hook as the opposite of Peter in many ways. First of all, he hates Peter and deeply resents his popularity. Second of all, he's deeply afraid of being eaten by the crocodile who has swallowed a ticking clock, so really it's the ticking clock that he's afraid of. Until, once again, Hook, where Hook has defeated the crocodile and... Turn it into a clock? So, I guess the symbolism is still there. And essentially, this hook has defeated the thing that he was most deathly afraid of, and so here is a hook that lives pretty much without fear. The Disney version of this character is actually one of the more diabolical Disney villains. When this version of the character hears that Tinkerbell has been banished, however briefly, he takes advantage of this and uses Tinkerbell's jealousy of Wendy against Peter. Watch this, Tia. Then it is true. It's a pretty clever way to take advantage of the weaknesses of all of our protagonists. Dustin Hoffman's hook does much the same thing with Peter's children, using Jack's bitterness of the neglect from his father against him. He missed the most important game on what might have been the most important day of your young life. And Jason Isaacs uses Wendy's weaknesses against her, exploiting her confused feelings towards Peter and having this romantic interest in a character that never grows up. He cannot part of the riddle of his being. And in the final battle, he uses Peter's fear of being betrayed and left alone against him. There is another in your place. Captain Hook is actually pretty universally clever in the movies. In the book, well, he makes a poison cake and kidnaps Wendy and the Lost Boys, but that's pretty much it. Even his kidnapping of Tiger Lily is a little confused, whereas in the Disney movie, at least, it does actually have a purpose. The chief's daughter, she'll know where Pan is hiding. But Hook is also very much a gentleman, or at least he wants to be. And so in most versions of the story, we see hints of this, particularly in the way he dresses. In the book, the gentlemanly Captain Hook is also portrayed in his deep desire for good form. It's one of the many things that Hook despises about Peter Pan, in particular on the fight of Marooner's Rock, Pan has an opportunity to defeat a disarmed Hook, but he gives Hook his sword back so that they might continue the fight. Hook takes advantage of this and comes pretty close to killing Peter, but in so doing, shows bad form against Peter's good form. And this continues to be a point of obsession for Hook as he tries to reconcile being a villain against being a gentleman, two personas that don't necessarily coincide. Like a persona who reviews books and a persona who reviews movies? Indeed. It should also be noted that Hook is not above killing to save his own neck, even if he's killing members of his own crew. The stage version that this book is based on gives us both of these aspects as well, with the book adding a little bit more subtext to his character. The stage version also starts the precedent that was later echoed in other visual versions of having Mr. Darling and Hook be the same actor. 
What are you doing? Trying to help you out. Come on, Matt. If the play can't have his own category, the least I can do is help you out. I mean, this was originally a stage play and the book is based on it, right? I can help you out. But being a play makes this a visual medium. You wouldn't rather help out Hatter? <laughs> of course not. That ignorant buffoon. This is a piece of literature, first and foremost. And Captain Hook is an iconic gentleman villain. Later stage versions, like the well-known musical, show Hook as very proper, even a little prissy. He even has his own band of pirates. And by that I mean a pirate band who play musical accompaniment while he plots in song. Okay, it's kind of bizarre, but it's kind of supposed to be. When you're portraying a villain who's also supposed to be a gentleman, you expect him to be a little bit comical as well. Which is why he often is played up for comedy in the movies. Though ruthless, Captain Hook in the Disney film is very much a comic villain, especially in his reactions to the crocodile, which provides some of the funniest slapstick in any movie. Dustin Hoffman, of course, always plays up the comedy of his character. I did. Yes, you made a boo-boo. I did. Mm. Jason Isaacs isn't as funny in his part, but he does have his moments. And then I'll shoot you right through your noble intentions. And they're able to do all of this without becoming any less competent or ruthless as villains. Until the crocodile shows up, of course, and this is where the movie hooks lose out for me. Though he's cruel and ruthless, and in many cases more clever than his literary counterpart, what decides this category for me is Hook's exit or his death. In the book, Hook is cornered by Peter and his lost boys, and so decides if he can't defeat them, then they'll all die together, and so he blows up the ship. Or at least he tries to, but Peter takes care of the bomb, and thus Hook is cornered again and decides he's just going to throw himself to his death as the crocodile shows up. But before he does this, he forces Peter to show bad form, bringing that particular story arc to a close. And it might seem childish. And it is. But he at least agrees with a certain degree of dignity and satisfaction. Whereas the Hook from the Disney movie... doesn't. And yes, it's funny, but exits made without dignity often are. Hook and the 2003 Peter Pan are a little better, but still more humiliating than the exit in the book. So in the end, it really does make a lot of difference because we see Hook as more of a person than a punchline. So for that reason, the villain has done better in the book. But well, now we've got Lost Boys, Pirates, it... Hatter? Uh, we, we might have just a, a little bit of a problem here. What is it? Um... I think I'm lost. Lost? I thought you were just at the book loft. Well, I was, but I think I may have spoken a little bit too literally when I talked about an <sighs> endless bookshelf background. Where are you now? What section? Uh, looks like used westerns. Okay, westerns are usually next to romance novels, and romance novels are usually next to sci-fi fantasy, and sci-fi fantasy should be familiar ground for you, so you should be able to find your way out without any trouble. All right, I'll give it a try. But now we've got Lost Boys, Pirates, Indians, and a really bitchy fairy to look at in other characters. Let's start with Peter's band of Lost Boys. These are the group of children who have become misplaced, and altogether, there are six of them, each with their own names and personalities. These personalities are a little bit more clearly defined in the book, and we get to know them a little bit better. In the movies, not so much. The Disney Lost Boys do have personalities, but they're pretty much just stereotypes. The fat kid, the smart ass, the little one, the twins, and... the other kid. The pirates kind of fall into the same trap as well, whereas the book pirates do actually have names, though admittedly their personalities are still a little lacking. Except, of course, for Smee. I absolutely love Smee. I think everyone does. How could you not? He's the perfect example of someone who is completely a victim of his circumstances. In another world, he'd just be a kindly grandfatherly figure or a janitor. And all the movie depictions of this character have been wonderful, whether it's the bumbling lackey from the Disney version. <laughs> I never shaved in this close before. The somewhat clueless man making a size to the camera in the 2003 version. I'm a little girl. Run then. <laughs> or, well, Bob Hoskins. Speed, translate. In three days, we're gonna have a war! And as for the Lost Boys, the Disney movie might have stereotypes, but they're thoroughly enjoyable stereotypes. Hook takes an interesting direction with the Lost Boys as well, showing the new generation of Lost Boys with a new captain where Peter Pan is something of a legend. And the stage version maintains those personalities from the book, as well as the petty bickering that you would expect from a group of children. We also get a chance to see how difficult it is for the Lost Boys to say goodbye to Peter at the end. It, hang on, Scotty. I thought you were helping out Matt. <laughs> of course not. Did you hear the dig that Fuddy Duddy made to Wendy in the stage version? Pfft. Jerk. 
Besides, I was always on your side. How do I just faked being on Matt's side? Mmm, and a fat lot of good that's done me. Relax, we'll pull ahead. How? Indians. Sorry? Alright, well, let's dispense with the elephant in the room and talk about Disney's portrayal of the Indians. It's... pretty bad. I mean, wow, you thought Aladdin's portrayal of Arabs was bad. But, to be fair, J.M. Barry's original portrayal isn't much better. And what you have to remember is that Neverland is the land of a child's imagination. So, pirates, Indians, mermaids, these are the games that kids play. So stereotypes are going to emerge, and if anything, the Disney movie did at least give the Chiefs some personality. Also, I really like the relationship between the Lost Boys and the Indians in the Disney movie. In all other versions of the story, the Lost Boys and the Indians seem to be enemies until Peter makes peace between them, but in this one, it's played up more as a game. When we win, we turn them loose. When they win, they turn us loose. But we can also see that when the Chief has his daughter kidnapped, he won't stop at killing the Lost Boys in order to get her back. And it does reinforce the image of Neverland as a world of imagination, though a sometimes deadly one. But the relationship between the Indians and the Lost Boys is best, I think, in the musical. Why? Because the Indians actually come back and help Peter and the Lost Boys fight off Hook and the Pirates, and a lot of it does still seem very much like a game, especially when they're making peace. Plus, the musical is the only version of the story I've seen that actually gives Tiger Lily some personality. In most versions of the story, she's just a throwaway damsel in distress, an excuse for the alliance between the Lost Boys and the Indians, as well as yet another person who has the hots for Peter. But in the stage musical, I really like the friendship that forms between Tiger Lily and Peter. And I like the way that they function as leaders of their respective tribes trying to get their people to be friends with each other. And finally, there's Tinkerbell, the bitchy little fairy who is Peter's constant companion. The book gives us a little bit more of a sense of what fairies are and how they work, so we have a little bit more of a context for Tinkerbell. It also serves to underlie her feelings for Peter, because ordinarily she would be the companion of a girl, not a boy. So why does she stay with him? Because she, like Wendy and Tiger Lily, has fallen in love with him. So beneath the bitchiness is actual human-like feeling for this boy. And easily the worst Tinkerbell in the history of Peter Pan adaptations is Julia Roberts in Hook. I'm sorry but this is just not Tinkerbell. First of all, Tinkerbell doesn't talk. She tinkles like a bell, hence her name. Second, this character is just way, way too nice. This is not the same character who tried to have Wendy killed by the Lost Boys. I don't know if it's bad writing or bad directing or bad acting or what, but it's bad. But the portrayal in the other movies is spot on. Neither the Tinkerbell in the Disney animated version, nor the 2003 live action speaking anything but tinkles. And the Disney movie also adds vanity to the list of Tinkerbell's undesirable traits. Really, the movies succeed in making Tinkerbell both likable and unlikable. She's unlikable because she's a bitch, but her loyalty to Peter makes her at least a little bit likable and makes us feel a little bit sorry for her when she's on the verge of losing Peter and, of course, when she almost dies. I mean, hell, Disney practically made her their icon. Overall, it's kind of a tough choice, but I think I'm gonna go with the movie on this one. Really, the biggest crime that the movies commit with these characters aside from Julia Roberts, is the fact that many of them are stereotypes. But since this is the world of a child's imagination, stereotypes make perfect sense, and they're still enjoyable to watch. So, movies get the point. Matt, have you made it to the sci-fi section yet? Well, I'm in a sci-fi section, but I don't think it's the right one. I think I'm in a library. Mm. Okay. Just keep wandering and we'll start the next round. Okay, let's see how this story is told in composition. Shh. So, I'm just gonna come right out and say this. This is a weird story. And I'm not just talking about the content either, the way that it's told is very strange. I've talked in the past about stories where the narrator seems to be telling you the story in person. You know, they'll talk to you directly, they'll refer to themselves in the first person even if they're not a part of the story, and they'll comment on what's going on. Peter Pan is the king of that particular storytelling style. Not only does it sound like J.M. Barry is actually telling you the story in person, but at times, it sounds like he's making it up as he goes along. He'll decide to switch focus for no other reason than just to switch focus, and there's actually a point in the story where there are several several different directions that he could go, several different stories that he could tell, and he actually rolls a die or something in order to decide. This has a number of different effects on the reader. First, it illustrates that adventures were, as J.M. Barry said, a daily occurrence. Second, since the number of adventures were enough to fill an English-Latin-Latin-English -Latin -Latin -English dictionary, it shows us just how long the darling children were in Neverland. Third, the brief descriptions of a number of 
these adventures describe danger from the pirates, from the Indians, and even from Tinkerbell and the fairies. And as you know from previous reviews, I love this style of storytelling, and this book in particular is very fun to read. And in a way, it almost makes sense for the book to be written this way, oh, because... Come off it, Scotty. I know you're on Hatter's side. He was getting suspicious. I had to help him with at least one round. Trust me, I'm on your side. He called me a jerk. All strictly necessary. Now let's talk about composition. It makes sense for the book to be written in this way because remember, this is based on a stage production where a number of different scenes take place. And honestly, the whole story and the whole concept of Neverland is very play-like in nature, where you have to suspend your disbelief a little bit farther than you do watching a movie. Regardless, though, of the stage-like story and Matt's enjoyment of reading, the composition of the story is pretty confused. It just doesn't have focus. It keeps jumping around all over the place. And yes, it illustrates the amount of time that passed and the number of adventures they had, but in the end, there's still only really one story that emerges. It's fun to read, yes, but it does sort of seem like Barry set out to tell one story and kept getting distracted by his sides. It seems like what the movies do, by and large, is take a largely incoherent plot and make some sense out of it, actually making connections between events instead of just displaying them at random. The book almost feels like a book of short stories with a bunch of the pages ripped out. The movies aren't perfect by any means, but they are a little bit more coherent and a little clearer. So for that reason, I'm giving movie the point on this one. But how is the land of imagination portrayed in imagery? Okay, so maybe Barry's writing style doesn't work from a compositional standpoint, but it works for imagery. Remember, Neverland is a land of imagination and adventure, and Barry basically gives us a series of games that children play. Plus, the depth and the scope of the descriptions cannot be denied. But neither can the imagery of the movies. The Disney animated movie is, of course, Disney animation with great creativity and attention to detail. Hook similarly paints a great picture of a land of imagination and play, and I like that we get to see it from the point of view of the adult Peter Pan. There's nothing here that Gandhi ate more than this. And the 2003 movie just looks great, combining the whimsical, imaginative side of Neverland and also the darker, grittier side. And the various stage productions probably give us the best image of Neverland possible. Remember, Neverland is born out of the imagination of children, and so it changes for every child that imagines it. And a stage production by its very nature, is going to change every time. When you think about it, this story is meant to take place on stage. Neverland is a place that's not quite real, but not quite imagination either. It's in that in-between place, much like a stage production is in between the imagination of books and movies. So the imagery of the sets, the costumes, and even the flying are just real enough so that we can easily imagine it, but not so real that we're letting the stage production do all the play for us. I can't even tell whose side you're on anymore. All that being said, though, the movies lean a little bit too far in the direction of reality. They try to make Neverland into a real place. We see this especially in Hook in the evolution of Wendy's Neverland and in the Disney animated version, which never misses an opportunity to create a new world. But in the book, even the descriptions themselves give a certain ambiguity, as if Neverland itself is something that's not always quite solid and real. And Neverland is supposed to be a little bit different for every child that goes there, because every child likes different games and has a different imagination, so its very nature is ambiguous, which serves the land and the story better. Matt, have you had any luck at all finding where you are? Never again. What the, the hell did this scarf come from? How did you do that? Oh, well, I recognize the place where I was. It's the same place where Alicia kidnapped me during the Twilight Review. Whatever, let's finish off the last few rounds. You want to start us off with story? Sure. So now to look at which version told this timeless story better. I had a Just Like a Christmas Carol, Peter Pan is a story that has been told time and time again through various adaptations. And also much like with A Christmas Carol, that has a lot to do with the story itself. This is a story that we have all come to know and love, and it all connects back to J.M. Barrie's original material. And yes, I do mean the stage play. I mean, even the musical is just J.M. Barrie's play with musical numbers. Sure, but unlike A Christmas Carol, the movies don't exactly resonate with the original material. You get a few of the familiar lines, but they certainly do take a lot Lot of liberties with the story, particularly the Disney version. Even the 2003 version, which is probably the most faithful, takes liberties with Wendy's character and Hook's manipulation of Peter. And then of course there's Hook, which tells a completely different story. And honestly, what makes this story resonate isn't the plot, which is just your basic adventure story. What makes it resonate is the character of Peter Pan, who is so fascinating in his ardent desire not to grow up, which we'll discuss in the final round. 
Right, and the movies really don't explore that aspect of the story very well. The Disney movie especially basically just turns into a fun adventure without any sort of exploration into why Peter is the way he is or whether this is right or wrong. And in the end there's kind of a typical good guy beats bad guy sort of ending without developing either character or the relationship between them. In contrast, the 2003 movie actually tries a little bit too hard, making the psychological drama of the story a little bit too forced and obvious. Look, he's all alone. He cannot love. You're a tragedy! She'd rather grow up than stay with you. Old alone. Can you explain to me slowly using small words and visual aids? Maybe, but the movies do have interesting takes as well. In particular, I like how much of a pivotal character Wendy is in the Disney animated film and how much she grows. The ending is kind of cool too, where it's indicated that Mr. Darling might have visited Neverland himself as a boy. You know, I have the strangest feeling that I've seen that ship before. Which still gives us the whole generational thing that we get in the ending of the book, but with more of a focus on Neverland rather than Peter himself. The 2003 movie also explores Wendy's character more and gives us sort of a backdrop for her character, showing us her life in London. And Hook is just fascinating. Though it does kind of deteriorate into typical kids movie towards the end, the first two acts are a really fascinating what-if story about Peter Pan. Sure, and they do that very well, Hatter, but really the focus of this story isn't so much on plot as it is on character and setting, much like a lot of stories that were written at this time, like the Alice stories and the Wizard of Oz. In addition, I like that the book's composition gives us a sense both of how much time has passed in Neverland and also the many, many adventures that Peter and company had. In the Disney movie, they were basically just there for a day, and Hatter, earlier you described the book as a series of short stories with a bunch of the stories ripped out. And while that might be detrimental from a compositional standpoint, from a story standpoint, I think it works in the book's favor. Remember, Neverland is the land of imagination, and while the movies do give us a fair amount of creative and imaginative atmosphere, the book's way of telling the story gives us tantalizing hints of stories and adventures that we can only imagine. Plus, as we'll discuss in the final round, the exploration of the Peter's character is much better. I think this story is served best when the storytelling is a little bit disjointed like this, so while while it might be a little sloppy from the compositional standpoint, the story itself is spot on. There, see, did I tell you? I told you that book would win the review. Scotty, what are you talking about? I haven't won, we've only done six rounds, and haven't you noticed a pretty glaring absence from this Peter Pan review? Peter Pan? Yeah, besides, I thought you told me that I was gonna win. Well, yeah, but I just told you that to throw you off the trail, so you'd think I was on Matt's side. You said that you were saying that to throw Matt off. Whose side are you on, anyway? Other than your own. Yeah, what's the deal? I mean, it's like you've been helping both of us to cheat. Well, I wouldn't call it cheating exactly, I mean... Come on, you were giving us extra help so as to push the review over to one side, though not doing it particularly well, I might add. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as though you're taking advantage of the fact that we're two separate people now to pit us against each other and... Oh. oh. Cassie put you up to this, didn't you? Uh, that's... <laughs> Weirdo. Final round? Absolutely. So now let's finish off this review by looking at our main hero, protagonist, and tragic figure, Peter Pan. When all is said and done, the point of this story is to explore this character. Peter Pan has become perhaps one of the most iconic figures in literature. He's a symbol of youth and childhood. Some see him as a great hero, some see him as a symbol of our innocence, but you don't really think of the words tragic figure when you think about Peter Pan. But honestly, the book's characterization of Peter Pan is kind of tragic, because it's not just that he doesn't want to grow up, it's that he's deathly afraid of it. And it kind of begs the question, if we were given the opportunity to go someplace where we would never have to grow up, would we take it? Movie versions of this character kind of mix in how they choose to portray Peter, but probably the one that best portrays his fear of growing up is the 2003 live-action movie. In this movie, Hook actually taunts Peter with the idea that Wendy is never going to stay with him because he will always and forever be a boy. And even though Wendy is one of the few things that Peter actually remembers as time passes, he still can't quite get over his fear of growing up. That is again, until Hook. The premise of this film is that Peter Pan did finally grow up after falling in love with Wendy's granddaughter, Moira. He grew up, married, had a family, and completely forgot about Neverland in his previous life. Additionally, he became everything that he detested and feared about adulthood. Peter, you've become a pirate. 
The film then seems to be about finding that balance between innocence and responsibility, and it is a pretty interesting what-if story about what might have happened if Peter Pan had grown up and become a man. Now on stage, the character has been played by a number of different actors, the, the tradition being to hang on. What? You should let Scotty. Oh, come on, after what? No, I know, did. I know, but I mean, you can't really say what you're saying. You can't really cross it. Can't as long as it's understood that he's not taking sides. Scotty? Why don't you go ahead and talk about the stage version? Um. Uh, who, whose side am I on? You're not taking anybody's side, Scotty, but this character was born on stage, so we kind of need you to talk about the stage version, so say your piece. Okay. Peter Pan is traditionally played by a female actor, and for the most part, they play the part very well. They really show that fear that Peter Pan has of growing up, as well as a lot of the characteristics of a child. Kathy Rigby does this especially well, and is definitely the best Peter Pan that I've seen, incorporating everything both funny and tragic about the character. One of the things I really like about her portrayal of the character is she makes Peter seem very ADHD. He can't seem to hold his attention on any one thing for more than a few seconds, and he's constantly moving, which really underlines Peter's characteristic of forgetting things so easily. But the complexity of this character depends largely on who's playing him. While Kathy Rigby did do a good job of playing this character, Mary Martin kind of represents the opposite end of the spectrum. She gets the bravery and chivalry down pretty well, but Peter is just way too mature in this version. He seems more like a childlike adult than an actual child. So when he's talking about how much he wants to be a little boy forever, he doesn't sound so much like a scared kid as a petulant kid. I just want to always be a little boy and to have fun. No one's gonna catch me and make me a man! And for as many versions of this character that are out there, none of them have the psychological complexity of Peter from the book. In the Disney movie, Peter Pan is the young hero. Yeah, he's a little cocky, but he saves the day, does so honorably, and graciously sends Wendy, John, and Michael home. There's really no indication that there's anything wrong with the life he leads, that he's missing out on anything by refusing to grow up, and we don't really get the sense that he's afraid of this prospect. Hook gave us some of the psychological stuff, as well as an interesting what-if exploration into Peter's character, but the backstory is pretty sloppy, and it does kind of regress to the kids rule, adults rule style of movie in the third act. The 2003 movie probably gave us the most interesting version of Peter, actually bringing the psychological drama to light, but the problem with this character is that he's actually too perceptive. One of the most tragic things about the character of Peter Pan is that he's not even aware of what he's missing by staying an eternal kid. He forgets things very easily, he has an extremely short attention span, so even if Captain Hook had tortured him psychologically, he wouldn't remember it. He doesn't even remember Captain Hook after he's defeated. The Peter in this movie is fully aware of what he's missing, but he chooses to stay a kid forever. To live would be an awfully big adventure. That's interesting in its own way, but the character from the book is completely ignorant and completely resistant to what it might be like to grow up. He won't even consider it, and in my opinion, it's much sadder to see a character making a decision in ignorance than it is to see a character making a decision in full awareness of what he's missing. So in the end, the book is really the only version of the story that captured the psychological drama of this character adequately, and for that reason, I think it is the superior version of the story. And so ends another Books vs. Movies review tiebreaker. No hard feelings, I hope, oh, Hatter? No, no, I kind of figured it would end this way. I'll get you in the next tiebreaker. I certainly hope you're not referring to what I think you're Oh, come on, to. you know I'm going to win the next review. No, you act as though it's a foregone conclusion, but it's not. Jimmy Johns? Sure. I mean, if it was a foregone conclusion that movie was going to win, then it wouldn't be a tiebreaker. Oh, come on, everyone, everyone knew this book was going to win the Peter Pan review, and we still made that a tiebreaker. Scotty, you want to come with us? On my way! He's a liar, a cheat, a scoundrel, and worst of all, a train. Captain Hook is a train, I'll bet you didn't know that. Mm hmm He looks like a pirate, but he is actually a train. Mm, people. Just looking at stuff on the 1940s, that's what I'm doing. Mm.
What a fascinating book on the 1940s. Yes, indeed. Absolutely fascinating. Fascinating. I hope he's not looking for history. 